I am uh, on the board of uh, the Museum of Migration, and uh, of course, Winnie Chung is being the immediate past president of our association, and we're very proud of all the work that she's been doing. So this particular event, of course, is to talk about Chinese and Italian opera, and we have two stars here, two operas <laughs> uh, on the days here. Uh, uh, Dr. Angela Clark and Winnie Chung, and uh, we were at the opera yesterday, the, English, the uh, Chinese opera yesterday, and it was quite fabulous and very interesting. Uh, there's a long history of this collaboration between the Italian Cultural Center and us, and we are very pleased that uh, we're able to bring you this this afternoon. So I'll leave it to the experts, and both of them are distinguished in their own right and know a lot about the subject, so here they are. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Who go first? Well, Angela, you have been involved with um, uh, UBC as well as in the Italian Cultural Center. Yes. And we've been participating in different things of uh, organized by you and me at different places, right? Exactly. We were calling probably not at the same time at UBC. Uh, I finished my PhD around 2007, so I don't know when you were there. Still there. Still there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I finished and then from there went on to the Italian Cultural Center, and uh, it's been a really great environment, and it's been wonderful to be partnering with the Museum of Migration, and, uh, you know, it's been a very creative partnership. Yeah, I remember the first time I collaborated with you was over an exhibition, a multicultural fabric and clothes. That's right. At the Chinese Cultural, right? Yeah, 2013 at the Chinese Cultural Center. And we were all doing textiles from our various uh, groups. And I brought in Italian, uh, you know, birth uh, child, you know, textiles. And it was really a wonderful experience. And we had a lecture series there right. as well. And that's yeah. how we started the friendship. Exactly. And the partnership. And the partnership. Between P60 Museum Migration and the Italian Cultural Center. That's right. Yeah. And you so graciously came to me with this beautiful offer to get us on board with this big um, international project in 2017. That's right. Could you tell us a little bit as a backdrop to what we're doing today? Well, so um, I had actually studied Italian opera in grad school, and I got very interested because we think of Italian opera as being very, you know, Baroque, very 18th, 19th century. But really, Italian opera has its origins in trying to revive classical culture, that the whole notion of Italian opera is going back to classical antiquity and trying to create uh, these miraculous pieces of literature that were sung like Homer's Odyssey. And so the first Italian operas, of course, they were kind of circumventing, going over the church, because for so long, the Catholic Church had dominated music. And so with Italian opera, the idea was they could use music to go back to classical antiquity, explore these, these myths. And so it really was an exploration of ancient religion. And so that's the beginning. A lot of the early uh, operas uh, by especially Monteverdi, they were all based on the figure of Orpheus and Eurydice, who is the god of uh, the son of the god Apollo. And this idea, he's the most musical creature and he has this story that's this tragedy. His, Eurydice, his beloved dies, he goes to the underworld to try to get her. He successfully gets her in the course of, of going to the underworld. He's told by the god Hades that if he looks at his wife at any point, leaving Hades, that she's going to have to return. Well, of course, he looks at her and that the story ends. That was the major Italian opera. There are zillions of Orfeo uh, operas on that theme. And so Italian opera really was about recreating this uh, uh, classical antiquity and all of those stories, stories that weren't Christian. So I had done an, uh, my first opera exhibit, actually, it was in 2012. 
and I partnered with the Vancouver uh, Opera uh, and uh, to look at opera in Vancouver. I wanted to see this connection of opera in the Italian community. And then uh, we revisited it. Uh, people from the Chinese Cultural Center came to me and said, well, why don't we do something on Italian and Chinese opera? And I thought, that's really interesting because a lot of people say, well, there isn't, there aren't any similarities. Mm -hmm. They're both called opera, but that, 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 so what? <laughs> but the reality is, as you get deep into it, especially when you're dealing with issues pertaining to the immigrant community in Vancouver, and one of the things Winnie and I have been talking about is doing sort of a series of what is it that gives an immigrant community, a poor immigrant community, a sense of dignity mm -hmm. during immigration? What is it? I mean, one of those things that I've been exploring is fashion, of course, food, uh, community, but opera was one of those things. In the Italian community, That uh, there are stories of two, which I found really significant, is the first story is that on the Sunday, the day off, the Catholic day of rest, the idea was that the parents they basically prepared the space for the kids not to bother them. Mm -hmm. They got the opera records out from out of the attic. They brought them down. They listened to the opera records. And the idea was the kids wouldn't bother them, that this was sacrosanct, that they were there with their opera records and this was their time. Sorry, I, I like to jump in. Yes, yeah, sorry. I may forget. This is so interesting that you said the parents created a space for themselves mm -hmm. so that they were not bothered by children. Yes. But in Chinese opera, it involved all the generations. Yes. They always would bring little kids, even babies. Mm -hmm. So as little kids, we all got used to all these glamorous things and shiny things on yes. stage and the noise and all that. So that's a big cultural difference. Yes, and I think so. And especially when you go to places like the big opera houses in Vancouver, the idea is they're a very formal environment that you wouldn't have children there. And of course, the notion is they're later on in the day. With Cantonese opera, you can have operas going on fairly early. So you could bring children to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I'd like to respond yes. to the idea that um, the opera has to do with some of the literary things. Yes. Right? So in this case, it's the classical Greek yes. and Roman stories. That's right. And in Chinese opera, whether it is Cantonese or Peking or Shanghai, um, the storylines always go back, especially in the olden days, to the heroic people, mm -hmm. right? Emperors, generals, princes, and all these people in the elite mm -hmm. right? and the nobilities and the literal, uh, literal classes, yes. um, the mandarins and, and the talented women and men. Yes. Right? And it is only in modern uh, Chinese opera that the themes and the people involved are different. Even small yes. people's moving stories got featured. Right. Yes, like for example, in Mozart, the idea of, um, you know, that, that you would have the maid taking part in the plot of the story mm -hmm. was rather an unseen mm -hmm. thing. And so Mozart was adding that idea of, you know, other classes being involved. Right, right. Yeah. So this is some similar, one theme that is very similar yes. to do with the nobility, the people who mattered in those days. Yes. But today, of course, and if you are a good artist, you will not restrict yourself just to one type of people. Yes. Right? It's a good story. You get it. You talk about a maid. So there's a whole opera, Cantonese opera, about Hong Lang, who is the maid. Yes. <laughs> right? It's not about the Xiu Jie that she serves. It's about her. Yes. Yeah. And so another theme I like to pick up, and that is the spiritual world. Yes. So... If we try to trace Chinese opera, Cantonese opera is about maybe 300 years. It's a regional mm -hmm. opera. And all regional operas had some kind of origin with the first artistic form of Chinese opera in a formal way. Yes. It's Quan Chu, 
Yes. So Quan Chi is six, seven hundred years old, but the opera actually went back further. It's like two thousand years ago people started, and it's always um, associated with rituals, yes, religious offerings, yes. and people put on masks and they'll be dancing and there's music. So it is a kind of offering to the gods. Offering right? to the gods. And That's the interesting right. thing is, I don't know about Peking Opera or Quan Chi today or Shanghainese, uh, but in Cantonese opera, as many people know, before an opera season uh, by a particular troupe, on the first day before the performances mm -hmm. start, there will be a ceremony and, and they will pay respect to Wa Gong Sifu. Yeah. That's the patron uh, of Cantonese yes. opera. So I look so tired because I didn't have too many hours of sleep in the last few days. We just put on three live shows in the Michael J. Fox uh, Cantonese opera shows in two days. And <laughs> before we started on Friday, um, even though a few of us are uh, Catholic and Christians, mm -hmm. Um, we participated in the ceremony to pay respect, but others who are in that spiritual uh, field, mm -hmm. they believe in a real God, right. right? who is the patron. And it was quite a ceremony. And I think Caroline, who is a, a photographer at many of these things, she was so excited. She said, I never followed the whole thing. And we witnessed how the the God is invited to be present. Right. And so we pay respect and ask for protection. Yes. So that respect, that, that aspect is still there. But another thing I want to mention is Cantonese opera in particular, in the olden days, very often the troops were invited by rich people because of birthday and celebrations, and they opened it up to a lot of people. Yes. Right? And even in the imperial court, they selectively bring in the troops to celebrate. And that was very similar with Ital the origins of Italian opera. For example, they were created, operas were created as, as a divertissement during a wedding ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, these aristocrats, they would actually, you know, pay to have an opera written right. for like a marriage ceremony. And it was part of the whole festival that went on when a real aristocrat, a wealthy aristocrat, Mm -hmm. got married and mm -hmm. that was the way of entertaining the people that had come from all the different kingdoms and that type of thing mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. but would the ordinary people in italy uh, have the chance to watch an opera well uh, they would there's no doubt about that i mean and certainly as time went on with the recordings and that the opera was also people knew got to know like certain operas especially in the 19th century uh, that they would get to know the lyrics to that sort of thing. So there was the potential. However, it's hard to say with like the seating. I think they probably had like a like lot the of gallery. The <laughs> gallery, exactly, exactly. But it was, opera was a fairly elitist type of thing. But I do think that they had spaces like Shakespeare Theater where you had spaces mm -hmm. where the poor people could come in and enjoy the opera as well, because a lot of these librettos, they became quite well known mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. you know, the whole idea is that the, the milkman can be singing an aria while he's yeah. delivering his milk. That's right, that's yeah. right. So in Cantonese opera, um, growing up in Hong Kong, we had the experience of going to attend some of these festivals. Right. They would go on for a whole month, for example. And often, oh, in the countryside, the villages, would be inviting them because they wanted to celebrate something yes. or they have a particular God that they want to pay yes. respect to. And so these operas are not just for people, uh, not just for the rich who invited them, but for anybody. So it's yes. open door and they will have bamboo stages set up with cover. Mm -hmm. So uh, anybody, it's like makeup yes. theater, makeshift, yes. but it's dirty. <laughs> it, it lasts for quite a while. And also, the, the, the opera would not just happen in the evening. It just went on 24 hours. Right. And uh, so who would watch at night? 
Well, I got really fascinated when I was working on Cantonese opera and Italian opera. I got fascinated with these Cantonese operas that were basically performed for no one. The idea is that it was part of the ritual of the gods. It had to be performed. You perform it during like from midnight to five in the morning. And many of these operas literally were five hours long. (laughs) And they just went all the way through performing these operas in honor of the gods, whether there was an audience or not. Exactly. I don't think any Italian opera performer would have been very happy with that. I I think Maria Callas would have had something to say. (laughs) So that, in that regard, it's very, you know, it's the the ritual is very, very prominent. Right. Right. Whereas in uh, the Italian opera, there's a lot more artificiality because they're trying to reconstruct a classical mm-hmm. tradition in this world that is essentially Christian. And it's this way of connecting with humanism. And so hum- opera is fundamentally an outcome of this desire for humanism to recreate mm-hmm. something that goes back to the old gods. But whether there was a religious ceremony specifically, I mean, I've never heard of, you know, Maria Callas off lighting candles prior. <laughs> I know she was doing her makeup, but I don't <laughs> think she was lighting candles before the performances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So even though there might not, there might not be human beings sit, sitting down at night yes. to watch, there was an audience. Yes. Because the performers believed that they are performing for the gods and also for the ghosts, right? Yes. This is a way of appeasing the ghosts, especially the wandering souls who have no one to pay respect and, to them. And also didn't, weren't, when an opera was performed, wasn't there the case of the space was being prepared, like it's opening the space, preparing the space for the divinities to come in before the performance yes. and then closing the space? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. And there's another practical side to these things. So the big stars would do it at night in front of the important people. Yes. Then the apprentices, people who are learning, and it's a lifelong journey. Mm-hmm. So you may have performed for about 10 years, but you are still down the ladder. Right. right? And so you'll be assigned the evening shift, the, ga- yes. the graveyard shift. Yes. So they dare not do that best because the gods and the and the ghosts were watching. Yes. Right? So those were times for them to really practice. Yes. And that's practicing time for them. Yes. Steve was telling us that he used to do all these night shifts. And yet that's where they, they got to learn yes. and learn a lot. Yes. So I uh, I will be interesting to talk a bit about the uh, Cantonese opera in Vancouver because uh, largely I mean in many cases there's a little bit different because it was generally the males that had immigrated to Vancouver so they were the ones that were the main for a long time the main uh, viewers of Cantonese opera mm-hmm. yes. Yes. And and that it became this opportunity for women to actually kind of create a liminality where because this was their way of actually becoming the star of the show. Mm-hmm. So let me just go back a little bit. Yes. Um, as many of you know, in the early days, only men could perform publicly. That's why you have a lot of Chinese men who would be playing female roles and Mulan form world-famous Peking opera artist. He's a guy playing the role of a lady, right? And they all sing in this pathetic voice. Yes. And in the uh, late 19th century, early, uh, no, early 20th century, late 20, yeah, late 20, sorry, 20 is 19. So uh, 18 would be 19. So late 19th century yes. in the 1800, things started to change a little bit, especially because when the Cantonese troops would go overseas and things started to change. And when they came to North America, yes. that is freedom for a lot of these female 
yes. artist. In back home, there were already some female troops, all female, because mm -hmm. if you are playing a romantic um, story, the Chinese old way would not allow men and women to really get too yes. close and intimate. So that's why it's all female. They can play that. Uh, but it's still not proper for women to be performing in public. Yes. And in fact, uh, according to the research we have done, the first time female Cantonese opera artists were on stage in public would be in North America. Mm -hmm. Now that yeah. has to be further work on. Right? Yeah. But it makes a lot of sense. Like you say, in most of the overseas first settlements, it's because the men would go to work, the migrant workers. So yes. they need entertainment. And they also miss their women folk. Yes. There hardly were enough women around. And when you could go into the theater, you can see these fabulous women on stage. Yes. And they're real women. It's a real treat. Yes. And so that encouraged a lot of the women artists to come overseas. Yes. And I think one of the display, the last one over there against the window with a woman standing, her name is Freedom Flower. That's her artistic name, Jiao Fa. So she was very famous in North America in different cities where the troupe went to. I wanted to point out that thanks to my dear friend Angela, Dr. Clark, I got to inherit all these display balls. <laughs> they were part of the exhibit. <laughs> and then we went over to afterwards, the Turandot was playing at the Vancouver Opera. And so we were able to do a display there at the Vancouver Opera with all of the, the photos about Italian and Cantonese opera, mm -hmm. which was really yeah. fun. So I make a side trip now back to the 2017 event because you did such a big job and it's an international thing. Can you just briefly talk about what that was about? Well, um, we had, it wasn't so much international, but what we had prior, we had done this um, Perform Migrations, which was a European Union project. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the, it was through the University of Bologna, and it started all of these discussions about immigration and how people assimilate into culture, how they feel comfortable, that process of, of immigration. And so uh, we had done an exhibit on immigration in the Italian community. And one of the things that came out of that was how opera really was a way for immigrants to, Italian immigrants to create community. For example, they talked about how they would go to the city opera and they would meet people in their community there. It was just assumed that they would all go there. The, the records that they had in the household, they would have family members send them records back from Italy or they'd bring them with them uh, when they had emigrated from Italy. And so these records really did become something that was a connection with their culture. And as I mentioned before, it was a way of delineating downtime mm -hmm. and respecting their space. Mm -hmm. But then also uh, the Italian men were interned in 1940. And the women, uh, unlike the Japanese internment, uh, the Italian men were only interned. The wives weren't there. And uh, the men actually were treated quite well. They had a lot of recreation. And one of the things they would do while during their recreation is they had choirs. Mm. And so they would have these opera librettos and they would work on these operas. They would practice. And even though they were in turn, they actually toured uh, in Eastern Canada around some of these small towns, even though performing opera. And so it was really interesting to see how this opera, while you need quite a bit of skill to sing these performances, these men were working on attaining that skill during the, that period of internment. Mm, that's quite unexpected. It, it really is unexpected. And uh, we actually have uh, one of the libretto 
uh, that uh, one of the intern men had in our museum and the son donated it to the museum. And this was their way of making it through the internment camp that mm -hmm. in soccer is uh, by performing. And you just, you realize that these art forms are really a way of creating space in sort of the worst of times. Right, right. So talk about creating space and uh, building community. Yes. And also making it through, like you said. And making it through making with it through. dignity. So yeah. if we look at how the early Chinese migrants, what their life is like, right? Except for the merchant princes, <laughs> the bosses who brought in mm -hmm. all these workers. The majority of the migrants, they were working in such harsh conditions. Yes. Coming from Southern China, warm climate, they would have to get used to the cold and the snow and all that, working out, building all the early roads in BC, yes. and the opening up the trails, um, clearing yeah. the forest, the railway, and also the mines, yes. not just gold mine, but the coal mine yes. underground as well. So they work in these very, very harsh conditions. And in winter, it could be too cold. Yes. So many of them would take the chance, downtime, right? Yes. To come out to the cities. And in the early days, most of the time, it would be the uh, Victoria. And I was so thrilled to find out when I was getting into the history of Cantonese opera. I was so thrilled to find out that, can you imagine, in 1880s in Victoria, in the 1880s, there could be five purpose-built, designed yes. theaters, not just makeshift bamboo stages. Five theaters. One of them is an 800 theater, mm -hmm. bigger than Michael J. Fox that yes. we used last night. And if you have five theaters putting on Cantonese opera every day during downtime, how many people would be attending? Can you imagine how prosperous yes. Victoria could be? All these people were paying a little bit to come in to watch the whole evening of show. Yes. You know, uh, Wally Chung, Dr. Wally Chung, yeah. who is one of our patrons at PCHC Museum Migration, Zhang Bak Fu Ni Sang, he is now over his 90 some years old. A few years ago, I heard that he actually is very involved. Not that he sings or he listens to, to Cantonese opera songs, but he told me that as a little child, Growing up in Victoria, he said, when it is opera season, and if there's a good show, especially the tragic ones, all the women would abandon the men. Yes. He said, five o'clock, they would bring the children, they would all go to the theater, and it's a whole night affair. So the men would have to defend themselves, <laughs> cook and all, all that. And he said, I was a little child. I just jumped from one chair to another, from one auntie to another one, and they all crying. Yeah. But it's a sad story. And he also said he was so thrilled. He climbed onto the stage to look at the music. He said, the musicians did not use music. It's all in the head. Yeah. And also in those days, it's very spontaneous. There's a lot of- um, Innovation. It, yes, yes. yes. And, and people just uh, improvise. Yes. And they have a storyline and then they know what to do. And the musician just pick it up from yes. there. And so you have to listen and watch carefully. And that is why it's part war rather than the English way of all doing it from the same score. Exactly. I mean, there wasn't that much innovation in Italian opera. And most of the opera houses in Vancouver were really as a result of the railway, that when the railway, the CP came in, the idea was that you had the railway, you had the CP hotel, and then you had the CP performance area. So you could come into town and basically just be downtown and you wouldn't have to go throughout the city. And so those operas really were contained to these major centers like the Orpheum. And, uh, and there are a few, a few of the opera houses mm -hmm. that are no longer, uh, they were downtown and they are no longer. But there, there, wasn't, there definitely wasn't that kind of impromptu 
thing. And what I found really interesting is that with the women ended up becoming more of the 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 viewers of Cantonese mm -hmm. opera than the men. And originally, you know, the men yes. were the ones that were the primary audience. Yeah, they got comforted. Yes. They came to the yes. Yeah. It was it would be interesting to find out because during my reading, I was was noticing that they were saying that especially some of the later troops when it around 1940 when Cantonese opera went into decline a lot of the women that performed actually ended up marrying and staying mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. how common was that oh I haven't done research on that but there were stories about that I think here in one of the display board there was a baby yes held by a wood I, a woman who is a performer, so she's all made up, and then there's a guy in regular clothes. Yes. So that must be the father of the baby, bringing the baby in to yes. see mother performing, right? Right. So I think that happened, but I don't know how yeah. common. May I just interrupt our conversation? I want to acknowledge the arrival of some of the stars at the back <laughs> from a multi voice, it's one heart. People, yeah. Yeah, Simo and our musician, Miss Wong. Yeah, thank you. You can continue to enjoy our conversation. Um, I just want to explain to our audience here, the first workshop on Italian and Cantonese opera is in English. We used to, all the MBOH workshops that we used to have, we used to have two languages, but this year, I'm just too tired after three shows continuously. Exactly. We, said, we make it simple. We just have one English and then the other one will be in Cantonese, different topic. And also that, that makes it easier because even though it's nice to be able to explain everything into another language to extend the um, appreciation of Cantonese opera, when you come to a certain level, it's not just the language, it's the concept. If you mm -hmm. don't have the concept, I give you the term in English, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. So I got away, I talked to Sifu, I said, oh, for the second workshop, we just do it in Cantonese yes. in order not to interrupt the flow of your conversation. Yeah. So I got away from yeah. the translation yeah. this way. <laughs> and those of you, if you haven't registered for that, but you understand Chinese, you want to check with the front desk to see whether we still have space if you want to stay on. The second workshop is going to be master class. It's conversation between two masters, right? Not to miss. But back here, yes. you have a conversation between these two women who've been very involved uh, as people who love the arts. Right? Yes. And also because of the immigration and yes. immigrant migration work that we have done. And this conversation is long overdue. Supposed to be done 2017. Yes. We just got so overwhelmed. No, we said, it was, no there was wait. so much going on. Exactly. And... And really, the exhibit was just scratching the surface in terms of, you know, Italian and Cantonese opera. And also, as we talked about before, this idea of what gives a community dignity during a time. Mm -hmm. And what I loved um, when I was studying the Cantonese opera is that there was uh, that float during the Golden Jubilee. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I heard that one. I think you could do. Could it be that? I think, yeah, it's right there. Mm -hmm. The one right there. The fat here. Yeah. And this idea that these were the costumes that actually are now in the Museum of Anthropology. UBC. UBC. And they were left behind. And at the in the Golden Jubilee, these uh, Chinese, uh, and they weren't opera singers, but they wore the costumes to give them a sense. It's not that one, it's the one next to it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. To give them a sense of dignity, this idea of that the float being this magical thing, thank you, and that they were entering this sort of mainstream Europe Eurocentric Vancouver mm -hmm. in this golden jubilee float. And they were coming across as ethereal and beautiful using these Cantonese opera costumes. And I th think it's so interesting because it's this notion about, and that's 
this uh, whole Cantonese and Italian opera uh, exhibit idea led to this idea to something else, which is how do immigrants use clothing right. to establish a, <clears throat> not just identity, but dignity mm -hmm. while they're an immigrant. <clears throat> so it becomes really important, the idea of what you're wearing on Sunday. Clothing is really, really significant as a way to establish that dignity. Yes. And I find that so fascinating is that these Cantonese opera costumes were a way of showing the city of Vancouver on that floor, yes. the, their dygnity. Yes, as a especially when they were looked down as yeah. dirty, not very hygienic, yes. their lifestyle and all that, and poor. And poor, right? Yes. And uh, uneducated. Yes, yeah. for, for the local Chinese communities to be able to put on a show mm -hmm. and um, they feel their dignity yes. is restored. Yes. Right? And they also are so, so proud to be Chinese too because of the long, long culture, the yes. rich heritage yes. with all the stories and the depth in the stories and the values in the stories, right? And so they feel proud culturally, even though they got discriminated and despised yes. in some cases. And that was the same for the Italian community. Going to these operas was a way of like completely dressing up, mm -hmm. that you wore your special outfits, you were seen, you were part of this high art, high culture. Uh, you, you knew other members of the Italian community that were going to be there. Mm -hmm. And so it really was, the, the consul was there. It really was a, a way to show the larger mainstream Vancouver community uh, just the, the dignity and how mm -hmm. they dress themselves and comported themselves right. in these environments. So this is so interesting. Um, this point that you have highlighted, um, I, I was uh, very, very uh, impressed. There was an article in the early 20th century, and it is in a mainstream newspaper in Toronto showing a female um, Cantonese opera, Fa Dan, but she's wearing very dignified Western yes. clothes. And she's also very sophisticated. And when she was interviewed, she said she plays the piano as well. This is deliberate to let the mainstream readers yes. know that do not look down on us. Yes. We are sophisticated. We also come from a very educated background. Yes, yeah, and, and have natural talents and are versed in many art forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is now 2.40. Um, this conversation can go on forever, but we do want to involve the audience. If you have a comment, a question, some of you have been here, your family have been here for generations. You might have stories from your elders. Um, about their life and your experience with the operas, whether it's Western yes. or Chinese. Do you want to participate by just putting up your hand and then we, we, we'll involve you in the conversation? Yeah. Jane. How do you think that none of, none of the opera theaters survived? I mean, there were so many of them. And when did the last one close? Uh -uh. You put me on the spot. <laughs> I'm not really a historian. I just got into the history and the research uh, because of interest. Mm -hmm. um, when the gold rush, that's the prosperous time for the Chinese community in North America. So it's not just here. Um, there's a long tradition. Whenever there are Chinese migrants, usually from South China, Guangdong province mostly, there would be Cantonese opera performing troops following. And it's a long, long, and, and even in China, in Guangdong province, up and down the Pearl River, they have the red boat, mm -hmm. Hongxun. So they travel up, up and down, visit all the villages. And so one item or one performance can last forever because you have different audiences. So this, I, um, Itinerant. Yes. Uh, this kind of tradition is very part of their life, the performer's life. So when during the Qing dynasty, uh, I, I have to diverse. Yeah. This, this is so exciting. I just learned it not long ago. 
all the all, during the Qing Dynasty, the Chinese, the origin Chinese, were conquered by the Manchurians from the north, another tribe, right? And they had to, the men had to tie a pigtail and shave the, the front of their head. And people could not wear the hang original Chinese clothing or hairstyle, mm -hmm. right? This is one way to say you are conquered. Right? Yes. And the only time they could wear Ming Dynasty or earlier Chinese clothes is when they are showing a story from the past, Cantonese opera on stage, right? And so there were some very rebellious people always wanted to take back the country. Yeah. Among the Cantonese opera troops, they travel and it's easy for them to spread their yeah. ideas. So one leader got caught. And so he had to, to flee. Uh, he had to, to get away. And so he took some of the people and traveled down to Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. That's not the only reason why the uh, artists travel around, okay? But it was banned. Cantonese opera was banned during that period in the Qing Dynasty. And also, um, in terms of Vancouver, was the head tax really, really expensive? And so it became prohibitive to bring Cantonese opera artists to Vancouver? Mm -hmm. That did not stop them, okay. right? So go, go. I digress. But I wanted to say that um, there's a connection about the people who wanted to uh, overthrow the Qing dynasty mm -hmm. with Cantonese opera. And in North America, the Zigong Tong, in English, is the Freemasons. They were the ones who sponsor often right. Cantonese opera troops, apart from the major, the rich right. merchants. All right. So the merchants, they can make money. It's not because they are yeah. patrons. They make money by bringing these troops over. So Jane, back to your question. When the community was prosperous, they could bring in these troops. And they build theaters, as I said, in Victoria. And then later in Vancouver. When in the U.S., they started excluding the Chinese with the Exclusion Act. Canada's always a few steps yeah. behind they find that they could come to Canada. So the troops came to Canada, and by then Vancouver started to take over this, this yeah. importance as a port and replace Victoria in, in terms of convenience. So right here in Chinatown, along Panda, Columbia, there were quite a few theaters built yeah. in the early 20th century, especially 1910s. Yeah. It's really prosperous. Right? And even beyond that, on um, Main Street and then further down, there were theaters playing Cantonese opera as well, right? And so when the Chinese community was prosperous, then you would have a lot of activities in Cantonese opera. But then with the exclusion coming now to Canada, mm -hmm. I said we are a few steps behind. So 1923, exactly 100 years ago, that act, the Chinese Immigration Act, we call it the Exclusion Act, stop all Chinese immigration. So that's totally cut off. You can't even sponsor yeah. these people. And don't forget, by 1937, the war broke out, right? The Japanese, um, Sino-Japanese War. So for many, many years, because of the war, things were going crazy in China and Asia. And over here, there's also the depression. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why the whole lot of trunks and trunks, right? Yeah. Of costumes and dogo were left behind by the troops. And the community here in Chinatown pick them up. Yes. They treasure them. They treasure <laughs> them. And they would perform. They would learn on their own. And there were some of them who might have, so like some yeah. of those artists stayed mm -hmm. behind. So they are the Sifu. So they kept it going. And that's why I'm so grateful to the to many of these musical societies, especially uh Ting Wan and uh Zhenma Xing. They are almost 90 years old. Next wow. year, Zhenma Xing is 90 wow. years old. So Zhenma Xing was carrying on that tradition in Chinatown. They had all these costumes, and by the 70s, they actually brought in a Hong Kong Sifu to teach them there. 
in Chinatown wow. and use those clothes. But around the 80s, I, I think it's the 80s mm -hmm. and close to the 90s, things were kind of going down. Yes. Uh, I won't go into the reason. That's another chapter. <laughs> uh, so this is the reason why um, our friend, dear, dear Bessie Johnson and Graham, yes. her husband, yep. They, these are professors in UBC. Mm -hmm. They came down to Chinatown often. They found these beautiful costumes. Chen Ma Xing was saying, well, we kept some of them, and then others we just give away or we sell them. And these two said, no, 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 no. Wow. They are real treasures. So they went back to UBC and talked to the museum uh, boss yes. and said, we should purchase it. So for a very good price, they purchased whatever's left. And today, and because later, people also donate, and Jeff Singh donated whatever they were holding. And today in the world, this is the biggest collection of Chinese costumes. Number one yeah. is in UBC. If you haven't seen it, you have to go and see it. Yeah. So, any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, are you willing to get thinking about it? <laughs> I'm not I'm not there yet. Our Sifu is there at the back. Our teacher is there. <laughs> Sifu, this person asked me, would I So Sifu is here. Um, but Sifu is so popular. He's got a lot of things to do right now, Sifu. Right? Uh, I don't know if there here, there are a lot of musical societies. And in Chinatown, there are people who are giving lessons. What about lesson of that? Do you do singing teacher? Well, well, there's a lot at UBC. There's a large opera department at UBC. So there are a lot of singers out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, and some of the early music societies, they do teach, especially early opera performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He was the one who was hired in the seventies. Uh, that I haven't heard. Yeah, he's I, I didn't know about that. I uh we celebrated him in UBC back in the days where there was a whole day of program. Oh, when yeah. he was 90 something yeah wow i interviewed him two weeks before he died at oh, 103 wow yeah he did a lot that's true any other comments before we break up so you have a quick look at things and we are going to give away three copies of this very valuable uh albert can you show common voices we are only giving three away because we ran out However, there's an electronic version that's available. It's even in our poster, right? You click on that or go to PCHC Museum Migration website. You can always get a copy downloaded. But we'll give away three copies. The rest, we'll keep them because okay. it's very valuable. Yeah. We've run out already. Yeah. So to, um, to close off, do you have anything to say well i just love being invited to this event and a part two conversation well, a part at two time. conversation and i think as we start to explore other avenues of the immigration experience i think other things will come out with regard to the role that opera uh, cantonese and italian played in immigrant communities and i think it's something that really needs exploring yes mm -hmm. What is the difference between opera and operettes? <laughs> In broadly, the so-called operettas. Operettas, operettas, yeah. yes. Yeah. What is the difference? Well, operettas are more contemporary music, and there's also <clears throat> a lot of comedy with them as well, whereas the opera tends to be this very long... Um, performance uh there isn't a lot of there isn't at all a comic element and it tends to have a story of a very long storyline that is also placed in history so the operettas are are lighter they're more contemporary 
<coughs> there's more of a calm element to it. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, I want to add to that. And when we talk about Chinese operas, they're not exactly opera as opera, no. right? It's more than, sorry, I yes. have to say more. Exactly. More than opera, the idea of Western opera. Yeah. Because it's more than singing. There is also Cheng Zhou Lin Da, four aspects. You sing, you also recite verses, wow. right? And it's different from talking and Cheng Zhou and acting. And so these three elements, but there's also Da, it's Kung Fu, acrobatic, and it's more than Kung Fu, it's not just fighting, right? There are a lot of things developed in this area. They, they, um, we gave a workshop a few years ago about Hai Ji Hei. So we explain about that. So here I'm not going to go into it, but opera is just a very handy word to borrow, yeah. to use and give people a reference, point of reference. So when people hear the word opera, they understand what it is. There's singing, there's dancing, right? That's choreography. I think you'd be quite hard pressed to have gotten Pavarotti to do some of that sort of <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the, his girth and everything, I don't think he had that degree of physical fitness. Yeah, so it's really <laughs> tough. And later in the second um, workshop, you'll hear from one of our stars about, you know, all these requirements. That's why it's a lifelong learning thing. You cannot be a Cantonese opera artist by going to school for four years or 10 years, no. right? You learn when you are little, you learn when you are even 30 years yeah. old and continue to learn. Yeah. yeah. So on that note, I also want to point out that um, because we do have another workshop coming up and I do like you to have the chance to kind of walk around. Uh, I want to point out that at the back, we have some refreshment for the next one because they pay for it. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. Uh, if you can just use the next few minutes to look at the display, uh, we're going to give out the three copies very quickly. And you go out the store. You can and we give out more than three if you like. Uh, how many can can we keep for PCC? Well, I why don't you keep the one side there? Like uh, We keep five. Yeah, five. Okay. Well, you can give away the three there and I'll take the other. Good. Yeah. 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 So we give three away. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if if uh, you can leave by three, five, five past three o'clock, this door, that would be good because we need to set the room up for the next one. And the three lucky people, who has the birthday today? Your birthday today? Close to today? August? Would you like a copy? Your name and your birthday? August the 5th. You are very good. Happy birthday. <laughs> belated one. Albert, could you please? Uh, Gino can help. Um, so you, you asked you ask for the next criteria to give away birthday, oh, wedding, birthday. anniversary, whatever. Well, I, I'm not sure anyone in the audience has recently gotten married, so I don't know. <laughs> wedding? Seven years before. <laughs> wedding anniversaries coming up? Uh, wedding anniversaries? Anyone just graduated? In August? <laughs> Graduation? <laughs> Heather, when is your wedding anniversary? Okay, there we go. Last one. Who really wants to have a hard copy? Shanghai <laughs> some. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.